Now, we've just read one of the most famous events, I suppose you would say, in David's life. You know, when you think about what he achieved over the course of his life, he had many um, high points as well as quite a few low points. Um, but this is probably, this one's probably right up there. Uh, you know, the account of David and Goliath, it's probably it's very popular in children's books. If you ever look at like a, a children's Bible story book, you'll often see the account of David, David and Goliath. But they don't normally show him cutting his head off, but they, they, do, <laughs> they do have this general outline of it. But the thought of, you know, the thought of a young man, a young man who wasn't even able to join the army and fight the Philistines, defeating an enormous and fierce giant, it's something that's kind of pretty inspiring, isn't it? It's pretty inspiring to think of that. Because, look, if David could slay such an intimidating foe, then maybe you could overcome whatever overwhelming adversary you are facing in your life. And so today I want us to look at some principles that we can apply in our own lives when we are faced with an intimidating situation. Um, have a look if you want to keep your finger in 1 Samuel 17, but look at Romans chapter number 15. Romans chapter number 15 and verse number 4. Romans chapter number 15 and verse number 4. It says, For what sort of things written aforetime were written for our learning? For whatsoever, that means whatever things were written aforetime, let's talk about what we find written in the, in the Old Testament. What sort of things written aforetime were written for our learning that we through patience and comfort of the Scriptures might have hope? Okay, And so one of the reasons facing up to and, and, and fighting a giant is so difficult is, is because I suppose on the surface it's something that seems hopeless. Imagine coming up against a giant. Wouldn't that be something you would think that's a, a, a hopeless task that you've got? But when we realise that many people before us have faced great difficulties and have been victorious, it can encourage us not to give up. You know, but to decide, look, we're going to do whatever is necessary to win the fight. Now, some people might ask a question, say, well, hang on, fighting, I mean, bloodshed and all that sort of stuff, is fighting something that a Christian should do? Is fighting something a Christian should do? Look at Psalm 144. Psalm 144 and verse number 1. Psalm 144 and verse number, verse number 1. It says, Blessed be the Lord my strength, which teacheth my hands to war and my fingers to fight. Blessed be the Lord my strength, which teacheth my hands to war and my fingers to fight. Turn you to 1 Corinthians chapter number 9. 1 Corinthians chapter number 9 and verse number 24. 1 Corinthians chapter number 9. In verse number 24, 1 Corinthians 9, 24, it said, Know ye not that they which run in a race run all, but one receiveth the prize, so run that ye may obtain. And every man that striveth for the mastery is tempered in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. I therefore so run, not as uncertainly, so fight I, not as one that beateth the air, but I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest that by any means, what I've preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. So Paul tells the Corinthians, look, that they should be running in order to do what? Just to compete. So he says, just run just to compete. Run, come last. Is that what he says? No. He says they should run in order to win. They should be running in order to win. That means doing your best. Doing your best. Don't need to turn there, but in Ecclesiastes chapter 9, verse 10, it says, Whatsoever thy hand findeth to do, do it with thy might. That means whatever you've got to do, give it everything. Do it with your might. Give it your best. Paul says that his fights, here in 1 Corinthians, he says he fights not like someone who's beating the air, but as though he's in an actual real fight. It's not just like pretending to fight. That's not what he's doing. He's fighting as though he's in a real fight. And what does he do? He controls his body. He trains it to perform at its best. Why? Because, as we saw, he wants to win. He wants to do the best that he possibly can, and we should have that same attitude also. Now, obviously, David, he was in a physical fight with Goliath. It was a genuine physical fight. There was, you know, grunts and bloodshed and all that sort of stuff is what was going on. Now, generally speaking, it's not a physical fight that we're in. It's not a physical fight that we're in. Look, if you go to Ephesians chapter number 6, Ephesians chapter number 6 and verse number 10, Ephesians chapter 6 and verse number 10, it says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armour of God that you may be able to stand against the wilds of the devil. It's saying, you're putting on armour. Doesn't it sound like you're in some physical fight if you need some armour? But he says, look, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood. This is not a physical fight, right? We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in 
high places. Wherefore take unto you the whole armour of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand. You see, we're in a battle, but it's a spiritual battle. It's not a physical battle, but it is a spiritual battle. It says the same thing in um, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter number 10, 2 Corinthians chapter 10, and verse number 3, it says, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations, and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God, and bring into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. So what's this battle? where does this battle take place? It takes place in your mind. The battle that we are engaged in often occurs in our own minds and our own hearts. It's a battle to think, to think right thoughts. Do you ever have a battle like that? To think, I need to be thinking different thoughts. Does that ever come to your mind? You know, that I need to trust God more fully. You know, not just trust God for our eternal salvation, but also to trust him to lead us and to guide us in our daily lives. To trust him to lead us and guide us. Look at Hebrews chapter number 11. Hebrews chapter number 11, verse number 6. Hebrews chapter number 11 and verse number 6. It says, but without faith it is impossible to please him. That's saying without faith you can't please God. It's impossible to please God without faith. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Do we believe that God will will reward those who diligently seek him? Well, here's the thing. Are we diligently seeking God in our lives? If we believe that God rewards the diligent seeker, am I a diligent seeker? Are you a diligent seeker? Matthew chapter number 7. Look at Matthew chapter number 7. Matthew chapter number 7 and verse number 7. Matthew chapter number 7 and verse number 7. It says, Ask. And it shall be given you. Seek, and you shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. Well, here's the question. Are we asking? Are we seeking? Are we knocking? Do we really want God to help us have spiritual victories in our lives? Turn your word back to 1 Samuel chapter number 17. 1 Samuel chapter number 17. Let's have a look at David and Goliath. Look at verse number 4. 1 Samuel chapter 17 and verse number 4. It says, and there went out a champion out of the camp of the Philistines named Goliath of Gath, whose height was six cubits in a span. That's pretty tall. You're talking like nine, between nine and ten feet tall. That's pretty big. And he had a helmet of brass upon his head, and he was armed with a coat of mail, and the weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels of brass. So he's big, and he's got big armor on him. And he had greaves of brass upon his legs and a target of brass between his shoulders. And the staff of his spear was like a weaver's beam. And his spear's head weighed 600 shekels of iron. And one bearing a shield went before him. And he stood and cried unto the armies of Israel and said unto them, Why are ye come out to set your battle in array? Am not I a Philistine? And ye servants to Saul, choose you a man for you and let him come down to me. If he be able to fight with me and to kill me, then we will be your servants. But if... I prevail against him and kill him, then shall ye be our servants and serve us. And the Philistine said, I defy the armies of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. You see, Goliath, he was a very intimidating character, wasn't he? Very intimidating. And not only that, he was seeking someone to fight. He was looking someone to fight with him. The Israelites didn't have to go looking for a fight. They didn't have to go hunting for a fight. The fight came looking for them. And that will often be the case in our lives. You know, sometimes a fight comes looking for us. It comes looking for us. What was the reaction of the the Israelites? Look at verse number 11. When Saul and all Israel heard these words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. They were dismayed and greatly afraid. Turn if you would keep your finger in 1 Samuel, but look at um, 2 Timothy, chapter number 1. 2 Timothy, chapter number 1, and verse number 7. 2 Timothy, chapter number 1, and verse number 7. The Israelites were greatly afraid, but what does God say? In 2 Timothy 1, 7 says, For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. And notice those things all go together. He's not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Look at Hebrews chapter number 12. Hebrews chapter number 12. Hebrews chapter number 12 and verse number 1. Hebrews chapter number 12 and verse number 1. 
It says, wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. And Hebrews chapter 12 comes after Hebrews chapter number 11. And Hebrews chapter number 11 goes through, it's like it's called the, the, like the hall of faith. It goes through all these great people of the Bible and the faith that they had and the amazing exploits that they did. Some of them achieved amazing things. Some of them suffered pretty nasty fates. But they were all people of great faith. And then it's, in chapter 12, it then says, wherefore, be, since we also are compassed, we're surrounded with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us and let us run with patience the race that is set before us you see we've got a race to run and then it says looking unto Jesus the author and finisher of our faith who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross despising the shame and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God for consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. You see, we've got a race. We've got a battle to fight. And in order to be successful, what do we have to do? Fix our eyes upon Jesus. It says, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. And the victory that Jesus can give us. Because look, Jesus looked ahead at the victory he was going to win. He did. He says, look, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. Jesus looked for a victory. He was looking forward to something. He looked at that victory that he was going to win. Instead of what? Did he focus on the difficulty he would have to go through? Did he focus on the, the cross? No. Because look, if you focus on the difficulty, and if you ignore the goal or the prize, you can be, what? become weary and faint in your minds. That's what he says here. He says, look, Jesus, he, for the joy set before me, endured the cross, despising the shame. He accomplished what he needed to accomplish. And he says we should consider him. Because if we don't, we might be weary. We might be weary, and we might become faint in our minds. That's when you think, you know, there's no hope. There's no hope. You know, I can't do it. I should just give up. You know, it's interesting, there's a saying, I think it was, was it Henry Ford who had that saying, you know, Henry, the guy, you know, he did the, the sort of production of motor cars, the Model T and all that sort of stuff. And I'm sure it wasn't original with him, but he was famous for saying it. If you think you can, or if you think you can't, you're right, whichever one it is. You know, so when you start going down a particular path, think the mind that you let, the, the path you let your mind go down, think is that really the direction that you want to really be going in? Because look, if you become weary, you can faint, and you can faint in your minds. But in contrast, what does the Bible say? What does the Bible say? Look at Philippians chapter number uh, four. Philippians chapter number four and verse number thirteen. Philippians chapter number four and verse number thirteen says, "I can do all things through Christ, which strengthens me." I can do. All things through Christ, which strengthens me. And this is in particular in the context. Paul talks about, you know, he's a leader whatsoever state he is to be content. He knows both how to abase and how to abound. You know, he can, he can be, whether he's full, he, he, and whether he's hungry. You know, he can abound, he can suffer need. He can do all things. But we should really have that attitude. I can do all things through Christ, which strengthens me. You say what? Even defeat a giant? Even defeat a giant. I mean, look, what giant is facing you at the minute? Now, you might be looking at the front thing. well, I'm not facing a giant. There's a short guy at the front. But look, <laughs> in your life, there might be some giant. In your life, there might be some giant, some, some fear. It could be. Some fear, some obstacle, some impossible barrier that you are facing. Do you believe that you can overcome it? Do you believe that you can overcome that barrier that's ahead of you? Look at Matthew chapter number 21. Matthew chapter number 21 and verse number 18. Matthew chapter number 21 and verse number 18. Matthew 21 and verse number 18. Jesus answered and said unto them, Verily I say unto you, If ye have faith... Oh, sorry, verse 18, sorry. Matthew. Sorry, Matthew 21 and verse 18. So I'm reading the wrong verse. Matthew chapter number 21, verse number 18, it says... Now in the morning, as he returned unto the city, he hungered. And when he saw a fig tree in the way, this is Jesus, he came to it and found nothing thereon, but leaves only. And he said unto it, Let no fruit grow on thee henceforth forever. And presently the fig tree withered away. And when the disciples saw it, they marveled, saying, How soon is the fig tree withered away? Jesus answered and said unto them, Verily I say unto you, If ye have faith, and doubt not, you shall not only do that which is done to the fig tree, but also, if you shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, and be thou cast into the sea, it shall be done. And all things whatsoever you shall ask in prayer, believing, you shall receive. Believing, you shall receive. Look, have you asked God to help you have victory? Have you asked him to help you have victory? 
And do you believe that he can help you have victory? Do you believe that he can help you succeed? You know, maybe, maybe you feel like you don't believe enough. You think, oh, I'd like to believe. Remember, was it, um, I'm trying to think it was a man or a woman. It was a man that came to Jesus. He said, Lord, I believe. And he said, help thou my unbelief. How do we get more faith? Well, Romans 10, 17. What does Romans 10, Romans chapter number 10 and verse number 17, turn it through to 2 Peter. Romans chapter number 10 and verse number 17 says, So then faith cometh by what? Hearing and hearing by the word of God. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Look at 2 Peter chapter number 1. 2 Peter chapter number 1. And verse number 1, it says, Simon Peter, a servant and an apostle of Jesus Christ, to them that have obtained like precious faith with us, through the righteousness of God and our Saviour Jesus Christ, grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, according as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness. You see, God has given us everything we need that pertains to life and godliness, but how has he given it to us? Through the knowledge of him. Through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises. I wonder where I'd find God's great and precious promises. Maybe right here. Great and precious promises. That by these, by what? By these promises, you might escape the corruption that is in the world through lust. And beside all this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge, and to knowledge temperance, and to temperance patience, and to patience um, godliness, and to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness charity. For if these things be in you and abound, they make you that you shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Turn back here to 1 Samuel chapter number 17. 1 Samuel 17. And let's have a look at how, how David dealt with the challenge of the giant. Look at 1 Samuel 17. Look down at verse number 25. Verse number 25. 1 Samuel 17 and verse number 25. <clears throat> and the men of Israel said, have ye seen this man that has come up? Surely to defy Israel is he come up. And it shall be that the man who killeth him, the king will enrich him with great riches, and will give him his daughter, and make his father's house free in Israel. That sounds pretty good. That means free from what? Free from paying tax. That'd be a good thing. And David spake to the men that stood by him, saying, What shall be done to the man that killeth this Philistine, and taketh away reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine, that he should defy the armies of the living God? And the people answered him after this manner, saying, So shall it be done to the man that killeth him. So notice, the men of Israel, they say, Look, here's this guy, and this is what the king's promised. And, and David says, what, Sorry, tell me that again. What, what, what exactly is... What is, what is the reward that's out there? What's promised to the man that does that? You know, that reward is being offered. Don't need to turn there, but in Philippians 3.14, it says, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Having something to press towards. You know, you wanna, if you want to overcome obstacles, overcome difficult things, you need some reason for it. You need something that you're pressing towards. Look down at verse number 28. Verse number 28, it says, And Eliab, his eldest brother, heard when he spake unto the men. And Eliab's anger was kindled against David. And he said, Why camest thou down hither? And with whom hast thou left those few sheep in the wilderness? I know thy pride and the naughtiness of thine heart, for thou art come down, that thou mightest see the battle. And David said, What have I done now? Is there not a cause? And he turned from him toward another. And spake after the same manner. And the people answered him again after the former manner. You see, it's interesting that David, he had some opposition. And who was it from? His brother. He had opposition from people that were very close to him. People that were very close to him. And you'll find the same thing. You, you'll find you can have opposition from people who are close to you. Who you might find discourage you rather than encourage you. That's just a fact. That's what David had to deal with. And that's what we have to deal with. But what did David? David, he wanted to hear again about what the reward was. He turned away. He didn't sort of stay talking to a liar. He turned away and asked someone else, what was it again? And they told him the same thing. They told him the same thing. You see, it's interesting that David, he didn't say, look, now how big is this giant? You know, what sort of armour has he got? How fierce is he? Is that what David said? No, he said, tell me about the reward. Tell me about the reward. Remember what Jesus 
what, 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 what is said about Jesus in Hebrews 12? For the joy that was set before him. Because of the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross. Notice, he endured the cross. He didn't enjoy the cross. He endured the cross. In fact, he even asked his father if it was possible for the cup to pass from him. Remember when he prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane? He prayed and was sweat like great drops of blood. And he says, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. So did Jesus want to go to the cross? But for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame. He went through it. Why? Because he loved us. He wanted to save us. In the same way, we need a reason to get through difficult times. You know, think about, think about the word motivation. The word motivation starts with what? Motive. What's motive? A motive is a reason, a desire, a purpose. That's what it is. You want to be motivated, you need a motive. You need something that's going to drive you. Now just to, to clarify here, I mean, it's, it's important to focus on where it is you're going, you know, what it is that you're aiming for. That's true. The objective rather than focusing on the obstacle. But it can be helpful sometimes to give the obstacle in front of you some attention. That can be helpful to some degree. Look at good at um, Luke chapter number 14. Luke chapter number 14, verse number 28. Luke chapter number 14, and verse number 28. Luke 14, verse number 28, it says, For which of you, intending to build a tower, sitteth not down first, and counteth the cost, whether he have sufficient to finish it? In other words, you know, consider the situation. Lest haply, after he hath laid the foundation and is not able to finish it, all that behold it begin to mock him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king going to make war against another king? Sitteth not down first and consulteth whether he be able with 10,000 to meet him that cometh against him with 20,000. So look, sometimes it can be helpful. You know, you don't want to go into things blindly. Don't just go into things blindly. You know, sometimes... Sometimes what we think is a giant is actually not really a giant. Sometimes it's a lot smaller than that. But because we refuse to look honestly at it, it can become much larger, much scarier than it really is. Now David, in his case, he had a genuinely dangerous opponent. Genuinely dangerous. Let's look back at how he dealt with it. Look back at um, uh, chapter number 17, 1 Samuel 17. What did he start with? The first thing that David had, was, we've seen, he had the reason why, didn't he? He had the reason why. The men of Israel said, Have you seen the man that has come up today to defy, the, to defy Israel as he come up? It shall be that the man who killeth him, the king will enrich him with great riches, and will give him his daughter, and make his father's house free in Israel. So he's going to be rewarded with all sorts of stuff. He had a reason why. And, so, and it's important. It's important to have that reason why. If you don't have a reason why, then when things get difficult, you'll go, well, what's the point of this? But if you've got that reason, that's something that can drive you on. It's important to have a vision for where it is you're going. Proverbs 29, 18 says, where there is no vision, the people perish. What is your vision? What would you like to see down the track? What reason do you have for overcoming? The second thing we see David did, look at um, down at verse number... Where do we get to it? Uh... We got, I think we got it to verse 30. He says, And he turned from him toward another, and spake after the same manner, and the people answered him again after the former manner. And when the words were heard which David spake, they rehearsed them before Saul, and he sent for him. And David sent to, said to Saul, Let no man's heart fail because of him. Thy servant will go and fight with this Philistine. You see, David, he made a decision, and he was prepared to do what needed to be done. He was prepared to do what needed to be done. Think about Joshua. You know, that, that great leader of the people in the past. And remember he said in, um, I think it's Joshua 24, last chapter of Joshua, verse 15, he says, And if it seem evil to you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom you will serve, whether the gods which your fathers served, which are on the other side of the flood, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land ye dwell. But as for me and my house, he's made a decision. We will serve the Lord. Not we might, we will serve the Lord. Colossians chapter 3 and verse number 23 says, And whatsoever ye do, whatsoever ye do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not unto men. Whatsoever you do, do it heartily as unto the Lord and not unto men. Look at Galatians chapter number 6. 
Galatians chapter number 6 and verse number 9. Galatians chapter 6 verse 9 says, And let us not be weary. Remember what? Remember what it's talked about in Hebrews? Lest you be weary and faint in your minds. It says, And let us not be weary in well doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. You see, it might take some time. It might take some time. It's not you, know, you make a decision and be prepared to do whatever it takes. That means you've got to keep on doing it. It might, might, might take persistence. It might take persistence. It's not going to happen instantly. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter number 15. 1 Corinthians chapter number 15 and verse number 58. 1 Corinthians chapter number 15 and verse 58 says, Therefore, my brother, beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as ye know that your labour, that your work, is not in vain in the Lord. Sometimes you've got to keep going. It's not that you just, I'll just try for a little bit. You just try for a little bit. No, we need to keep on going, to keep on persisting and cons consist consistently, persistently. But it starts with a decision. David says, yep, where is he? I'll fight him. I'll do it. I'll do what these other people are, prepared, are not prepared to do. Now I wonder why David was able to do that. I wonder why he was able to do that. Turn back to, to chapter number 17. Turn chapter, back to chapter number 17. Look at verse number 33. Verse number 33. And Saul said to David, Thou art not able to go up against this Philistine to fight with him, for thou art but a youth, and he a man of war from his youth. And David said unto Saul, Thy servant kept his father's sheep. And there came a lion and a bear and took a lamb out of the flock. And I went out after him and smote him and delivered it out of his mouth. And when he arose against me, I caught him by his bed and smote him and slew him. Thy servant slew both the lion and the bear, and this uncircumcised Philistine shall be as one of them, seeing he hath defied the armies of the living God. You see, David, he didn't start by defeating Goliath. That wasn't the first thing he did. He won smaller battles first. He had smaller battles that he won first. Because look, winning smaller battles can give you confidence to take on larger challenges. You know? Look at what you can do. I often use the example with my, with my kids. You, know, you want them to tidy their room. You know, what do they do? They go to the room and they look and they find what they can't do. They find something that's too big, that's too heavy, that needs to go up high, something they can't do. But that's not the way you're supposed to do it. Look, you're supposed to go and say, look, what can I do? What can I do? Do the thing that you can do. Make a start. Do something like that. Because look, later on, what used to seem hard is later on going to seem easy. You know? I mean, it doesn't... I'm just trying to think how long ago it was. It doesn't seem that long ago that we drove up to Omaru for you to sit your driving test. That doesn't seem that long ago. How long ago was it? Two years. It, wasn't, it was less than two years. Because it was just before Christmas. Just before Christmas, must have been. Wasn't it? I think it was. Yeah, I think it was. Because it was getting close because they were shutting down. They were shutting down for Christmas. They were all booked up down here. So it was, I think, it's, it's under two years ago. And it was like, thinking of driving up there to sit a driving test. Isn't it scary to sit a driving test? And a manual, you know, you've got to do that stick thing. But, and yet now, it's like, I mean, if you want someone to drive around, you'd probably be better with him than me. I mean, he's got better eyesight, you know. He spends so much more time on the road. It's just like, that doesn't take long. And yet looking back now, you think, at the time it seemed hard and scary. But now, it's easy. You can do it with your eyes shut, practically. Yeah. Well, anyway, something like that. What else did David do? So he had... He had his reason. He had his reason why he was focusing on that. He made a decision. He started with the smaller battles first, but then look what it says in verse number 37. And David said, moreover, the Lord that delivered me out of the poor of the lion and out of the poor of the bear, he will deliver me out of the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said unto David, go and the Lord be with thee. Look down at verse number 45. Then said David to the Philistine, Thou comest to me with a sword and with a spear and with a shield, but I come to thee in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom thou hast defied. This day will the Lord deliver thee into mine hand, and I will smite thee and take thine head from thee, and I will give the carcass of the host of the Philist the carcasses of the host of the Philistines this day unto the fowls of the air and to the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. And all this assembly shall know that the Lord saveth not with sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hands. You see, David fought with God's power. 
whether it was with the, against the lion or the bear, or against the Philistine, against Goliath and the rest of the Philistines. So it wasn't just him. He says, I get the carcasses of these Philistines, they're going to be for the birds to eat. Why was God with David? Maybe because David was with God. Because David was with God. Look at James chapter number 4. James chapter number 4 and verse number 8. James chapter number 4 and verse number 8. It says, draw nigh to God and he will draw nigh to you. You want God to be near you? How about you get near God? Draw nigh to God and he will draw nigh to you. You say, where are we going to find God? Well, the Bible says, lo, I come in the volume of the book that is written of me. Draw nigh to God and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. You see, draw nigh to God and how about cleanse your hands? Cleanse your hands, ye sinners. Purify your hearts, ye double-minded. How about doing what God tells you to do? Look at 1 John chapter number 3. 1 John chapter number 3 and verse number 22. 1 John chapter number 3 and verse number 22. You see, God was with David and he was helping him. David no doubt prayed when he went in to fight against this Philistine. Look what it says in 1 John chapter 3 and verse number 22. It says, And whatsoever we ask we receive of him, because we keep his commandments. And do those things that are pleasing in his sight. Whatsoever we ask, we receive of him. Because we keep his commandments. See, it's good. You had to ask. James says you have not because you ask not. You've got to ask. Whatsoever we ask, we receive him. Because we keep his commandments. And do those things that are pleasing in his sight. And this is his commandment. That we should believe on the name of his son, Jesus Christ. And love one another as he gave his commandment. And he that keepeth his commandments dwelleth in him, and he in him. And hereby we know that he abideth in us by the Spirit which he hath given us. You see, David had the Spirit of God dwelling in him. He had the Spirit of God. You know, the Spirit of God spake by him. His word was in his tongue. He, David was the sweet psalmist of Israel. Not only that, keeping his commandments, but also asking for the right things as well. Look across to chapter number 5. 1 John 5 and verse number 14 says, And this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us. And if we know that he heareth us, whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we desire of him. You see, fighting against the Philistines, that's what God wanted his people to do. He wanted God, he wanted David to do that. So what did David have? David had a reason why. He made a decision. He was going to do what it took. He was prepared by winning smaller, smaller battles. You know, this wasn't the first time that David had picked up a sling. It's like, oh, here's the giant. Okay, I better learn how to use a sling and a stone. That's not what happened. Okay, he must have trained for years and years to develop the skill to use a sling as a deadly weapon. I mean, if you gave me a sling, would you be scared of me? No. No. <laughs> because in my hands, a sling is not a deadly weapon. But in David's hands it was, because he, he would have trained for years and years and years. And of course the Lord taught his hands to fight. And obviously God was with him. God was with him. What did we read before? Blessed be the Lord my strength, that teaches my hands to war and my fingers to fight. Look back at 1 Samuel 17. 1 Samuel 17, look down at verse number 38. Verse number 38. It says, And, da and Saul armed David with his armour. And he put a helmet of brass upon his head. Also he armed him with a coat of mail. And David girded his sword upon his armour. And he essayed to go, for he had not proved it. And David said unto Saul, I cannot go with these, for I have not proved them. And David put them off him. And he took his staff in his hand, and he chose him five smooth stones out of the brook, and put them in a shepherd's bag, which he had, even in his scrip. And his sling was in his hand, and he drew near to the Philistine. You see, David used the things that worked. Things which he had tested. Things that he could rely on. And look, when you're facing a challenge, look at what you have used to overcome difficulties before. Because you, whoever you are, you've overcome difficulties in your life. There's things that you've done before. Look back, how did you overcome those? You know, sometimes, sometimes when people are faced with a challenge, it can overwhelm them. And it can seem like it's larger than a giant. But look, if we take time to reflect on what God has already done for us, and what victories we have already won, it can strengthen us for whatever lies ahead. It's true that look, we should look forward at where we're going. That's true. You know, Paul said, this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind, 
and reaching forth unto those things which are before. I press toward the mark for the prize of the high call of God in Christ Jesus. But look, when Paul said forgetting what's behind and reaching forward, he was talking about not getting caught up in your past failures. But there's nothing wrong with looking back at past successes, looking back at things that you that did well. You know? Because you can use that. You can use that to say, well, if I did that, then maybe I can do this. Because look, you don't go from zero to 100. You know, it's like, you win a victory here, and win a victory. You build upon this, build upon that. You know, David, when he got better with using the sling, at the start, when he first tried to use the sling, he was probably pretty useless. But he got better, and he got better, and he got better. He trained and became more and more proficient. And he used, you know, Saul said, look, here's my armour. You know, here, here's all my stuff. And Saul, we know, you know, David wasn't the, the biggest of guys, but Saul, I mean, here's the thing. Saul was taller than all the Israelites. He was the tallest, like, a, you know, head and shoulders above them. If anyone should have been going out fighting the giant, it should have been Saul. But whatever, Saul then is going to give his stuff to David. It's like, no, I can't use this. What else can we see? How about this? What David had to do is David had to look forward. He had to look forward. Because look, if you're looking forward, you're going to have to face your challenge and not run away. You have to actually face it, not run away. What did David do? Look down at verse number, verse number 48. And it came to pass when the Philistine arose and came and drew nigh to meet David, that David hasted and ran toward the army to meet the Philistine. He ran. He ran towards his enemy. Because look, when you try to run away from your troubles and your fears, what do they do? You know, you turn away from them and you run the other direction. Do they just leave you alone or do they follow you? They follow you. So it, it doesn't get you away from them. They follow, but not only do they follow you, when you've got your back turned to them, it's like they get bigger. They get bigger and stronger. They grow. But instead, look, what did David do? He turned and faced. He ran towards it. He faced his fear. The giant wasn't any bigger in David's eyes because he looked straight at it. Now, it was a giant, but if he turned the other way, it would have been a much bigger giant. Look at, um, look at Matthew chapter number 10. Matthew chapter number 10. Instead of being afraid, David faced the enemy. He faced the giant. Matthew chapter number 10 and verse number 28. Matthew chapter number 10 and verse number 28. It says, And fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Jesus is saying, look, don't fear man, but who? Fear God. Don't fear man, but fear God. Are not two sparrows sold for a father? And one of them shall not fall on the ground without your father. But the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Isn't that encouraging? It is encouraging, isn't it, Dave? The hairs of your head, they're all numbered. And then he says, look, fear ye not, therefore. You have more value than many sparrows. You have more value than many sparrows. Turn it to Acts chapter number four. You see, Jesus told his disciples, don't fear. Don't fear. Fear God, but don't fear anyone else. And then when we look at his disciples, did they follow what he said to do? Look at Acts chapter number four. Acts chapter number four. And as they spake unto the people... And the priests, the captain of the temple and the Sadducees, came upon them, being grieved that they taught the people and preached through Jesus the resurrection from the dead. And they laid hands on them and put them in hold until the next day, for it was now eventide. Howbeit many of them which heard the word believed, and the number of the men was about 5,000. And it came to pass on the morrow that their rulers and elders and scribes, and Annas the high priest, and Caiaphas and John, and Alexander, and as many as were of the kindred of the high priest, were gathered together at Jerusalem. And when they had set them in the midst, they asked, by what power or by what name have you done this? Look at this, verse 8. Then Peter, filled with the Holy Ghost, said unto them, Ye rulers of the people and elders of Israel. So notice, Peter's talking to the leaders, the important people. And who was he? He was some ignorant fisherman. But he stands, he says, Look, ye rulers of the people and elders of Israel, if we this day be examined of the good deed done to the infinite man, by what means he's made whole, be it made known unto you all, and to all the people of Israel, that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, and Lord, as he say next, whom ye crucified, whom God raised from the dead, even by him doth this man stand here before you whole. 
This is a stone which is set at naught of you builders, which has become the head of the corner. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men, whereby we must be saved. So they were in trouble for preaching about Jesus. And so he says, look, you killed him, and it was Jesus that made this man whole. And there's no salvation apart from in Jesus. Was Peter intimidated? Or was he bold? He was bold. And look what it says. Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men, they marveled. And they took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. See, because Jesus wasn't upset. Jesus was bold. And they picked up that boldness from Jesus. Because Jesus said, don't fear man. Fear God. And beholding the man which was healed, standing among them, they could say nothing against it. But when they had commanded them to go aside out of the council, they conferred among themselves, saying, what should we do to these men? For that indeed a notable miracle hath been done by them. It is manifest to all them that dwell in Jerusalem, we cannot deny it. But that spread no further among the people, let us straightly threaten them, that they speak henceforth to no man in this name. So we're going to threaten them. Don't do this. Do not do this. And they called them and commanded them not to speak at all, nor teach in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered and said unto them, Whether it be right in the sight of God to hearken unto you more than God, judge ye. They didn't say, Yes, sir. You see, look, should we listen to you, or should we listen to God? For we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. So when they further threatened them, so they threatened them some more, they let them go, finding nothing how they might punish them, because of the people, for all men glorified God for that which was done. For the man was about 40 years old, upon whom this miracle of healing was showed. And being let go, they went to their own company, and reported all that the chief priests and elders had said unto them. And when they heard that, they lifted up their voice to God with one accord and said, Lord, thou art God, which has made heaven and earth and the sea and all that in them is, who by the mouth of thy servant David had said, Why did the heathen rage and the people imagine vain things? The kings of the earth stood up and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. The important people are fighting against them. For of a truth against thy holy child Jesus, whom thou hast anointed both Herod and Pontius Pilate with the Gentiles and the people of Israel were gathered together, for to do whatsoever thy hand and thy counsel determined before to be done. And now, Lord, behold their threatenings, and grant unto thy servants that with all boldness they may speak thy word, by stretching forth thy hand to heal, and that signs and wonders may be done by the name of thy holy child Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and they spake the word of God with boldness. So they weren't intimidated. They weren't intimidated. They faced them head on and said, no, we're just going to keep on doing it. And they prayed and God filled them with the Spirit and they spake boldly. Last thing we'll look at back in 1 Samuel 17. Back in 1 Samuel 17. Notice when David went against this Philistine, how many people went with him? How many people went to face Goliath? No one. It's just him. So that means you need to be prepared to fight alone if you have to. Be prepared to fight alone if you have to. Now obviously, obviously it's great to be backed up. It's great to be encouraged by others. I mean, it's one of the reasons we come to church. You know, the Bible says, you know, let us consider one another, provoke unto love and the good works. Not forsaking the assembly of ourselves together, as the matter of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. But look, even if you feel like you're on your own, realize look, there's a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. Jesus said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. When he left, he said, Look, he said to his disciples, If I don't go away, I'll, you know, the comfort is not going to come. He says, I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. Matthew 28, he said, Lo, I'm with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. Look at Psalm 27. Psalm 27. You might be in a frightening situation. You might be facing some giant in your life, some, something that's just overwhelming you. Think, How can I deal with this? Look at Psalm 27. This is a great psalm. Psalm 27. Lo and behold, it's a psalm of David. Psalm 27. It says, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is my light and my salvation, whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life, of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked, even mine enemies and my foes, came upon me to eat up my flesh, 
they stumble and fell. Though an host should encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war should rise against me, in this will I be confident. One thing have I desired of the Lord, that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. For in the time of trouble, he shall hide me in his pavilion. In the secret of his tabernacle shall he hide me. He shall set me up upon a rock. And now shall my head be lifted up above mine enemies, round about me. Therefore will I offer in his tabernacle sacrifices of joy. I will sing, yea, I will sing praises unto thee. Hear, O Lord, will I cry with my voice. Have mercy also upon me and answer me. When thou said, Seek ye my face, my heart said unto thee, Thy face, Lord, will I seek. Hide not thy face far from me. Put not thy servant away in anger. Thou hast been my help. Leave me not, neither forsake me, O God of my salvation. Jesus said, I will never leave thee, nor forsake thee. Look at verse 10. When my father and my mother forsake me, then the Lord will take me up. Teach me, O Lord, and lead me in a plain path because of mine enemies. Deliver me not over unto the will of mine enemies, for false witnesses have risen up against me, and such as breathe out cruelty. I had fainted, unless I had believed to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait on the Lord, be of good comfort, and he shall strengthen thine heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. David went by himself, but he didn't go by himself because he had God. He had God with him. You know, there was a time when, uh, later on, when he's out in the wilderness, you know, and everyone was right, people wanted to stone him. But it says David encouraged himself in the Lord. The title of the sermon is Facing a Giant. Facing a Giant. Maybe you've got something really big and scary that makes you want to run and hide. Some difficulty, some obstacle that you can't see how you can overcome. If you don't have one at the minute, you're going to have one soon. You're going to have one soon. What are you going to do when the battle comes looking for you? What did David do? Well, look, he had a reason why. He had a, he had a reason why, just like Jesus, for the joy that was set before him. He made a decision that he was prepared to do what it takes. Look, is this what needs to be done? Okay, then I'm going to fight that fight. And I'm going to win that fight. He didn't start with the biggest battle. He had, let's, let's get some small victories first. Let's look at what I've done in the past. Let's do these things. One thing at a time. He trained. He fought... In his own strength? With God's power. With God's power. Jesus said, you know, apart from me, you can do nothing. But I can do all things through Christ, which strengthens me. And David, obviously, he used what works. He wasn't trying some other crazy thing. Look, stick with the tried and true. And look, you can't get more tried and true than this. You can't get more tried and true than this. He had to face his challenge. You didn't turn around, turn away from it and ignore it. Because look, if you ignore your problems, they don't get they don't get better, they don't get smaller, they get bigger. Face. Face them. And even when he had to go by himself, that's what he did. He went by himself and he did it. And interesting, look what happened though. He went and fought, he ran toward. Look at verse 48. It came to pass when the Philistine arose and came and drew nigh to meet David, that David hasted and ran toward the army to meet the Philistine. And David put his hand in his bag and took thence a stone and slang it and smote the Philistine on his forehead, that the stone sank into his forehead, and he fell upon his face to the earth. So David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and with a stone and smote the Philistine and slew him, but there was no sword in the hand of David. Therefore David ran and stood upon the Philistine and took his sword and drew it out of the sheath thereof and slew him and cut off his head therewith. And when the Philistines saw that their champion was dead, they fled. And the men of Israel and of Judah arose and shouted and pursued the Philistines until they had come to the valley and to the gates of Ekron. And the wounded of the Philistines fell down by the way to Shearim, even unto Gath and unto Ekron. And the children of Israel returned from chasing after the Philistines and they spoiled their tents. Look, what happened when David had his victory? It helped the others. It helped all those Israelites that were afraid. Because when you overcome something, that shows other people that they can overcome something. And maybe there's something that you're battling in your life. How can I do this? Well, one of the things that you can put before you as a, as a, as a goal, as a motivating factor, is to say, look, when I overcome this, 
other people realize they can overcome it too. And that's what David did. He won the victory, and suddenly the Israelites, hey, they were all fighting, and, and it was all going. So, you know, do it for yourself, because God does want you to have victory. God wants you to be successful. You know, the Bible says in, in Joshua 1 8, this book of the Lord shall not depart out of the mouth, they shall meditate therein day and night, they must observe to do according to all that is written therein, for then they shall make their way prosperous, and then they shall have good success. God wants us to have success. But he wants, as we saw, others. You know, within the church, it's all about edifying the church. That's the purpose. What can you do? When you help yourself, you can help others achieve you can, what you've achieved. You can overcome for their good. Defeating a giant. You can do it. You might think, I can't do it, I'm just little. Well, David wasn't big. They said he was just a lad. Did anyone else think he could do it? No. But David believed in his God and he knew that he could. Let's pray. Gracious Lord, we thank you for your word. And Lord, I just pray that you'd help each one of us to face the giants in our life. To fight the giants in our life. And to defeat the giants in our life. Lord, we thank you that you are such a great God. Such a powerful God. We thank you that you are the one that we can look to for victory, for strength, for encouragement. We thank you and praise you and love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.